drawing workshop. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to just leave them in the chat and we'll be asking them as the workshop goes on. And thanks again for joining us. <laughs> oh yeah, that. Find the pose. I think. What do you think? Is that good? I think so. I Could I have you the bit of hair that's behind? Could you just kind of like a little bit of a tug forward, so that it kind of like drapes behind your ear a little? It's good to me. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. And um, whenever you guys are in a good spot, um, what are your thoughts on how you're going to be starting after resuming from yesterday? What are you guys kind of thinking? What's your game plan if you have one? Oh boy. I'm gonna go first. Some ways I'm still finding mine right now. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, so, I think on the next day, I'm trying to come in with a fresh eye, um, fresh mind for checking in on the structure and making sure that there's not anything that's super out of whack, uh, contradicting other kinds of axes. Um, also assessing, generally, for I think both of us were concerned with getting the drawing to all come up at the same time. Right now, I very clearly have more information in the mouth and the picture right eye and the nose and the picture left eye are, you know, lagging behind. So I think I need to get those up to speed. Um, and then at that point, I would probably either add, I think, more interior information and specificity um, inside of each of the features at that point, and then my value range and start modeling. Um, that's kind of what I'll be I'll be trying to do this morning. And then how about you, Ty? Yeah, I'm trying to just come in and I guess search through the drawing as if it's the first time I'm seeing it. Um, I left off yesterday with some structural issues in the eyes and the mouth, in particular, that I want to solve today. Because this is a six-hour pose, it's going to be abbreviated. So I'm not going to fully model the whole thing. Um, by the end of the day, I'd like to punch in some highlights with gouache and then I guess resolve some resolution in the features and maybe turn a little bit out of some of these terminators. How do you usually go about like problem solving? If you know that something is a little bit wonky in the drawing, like what is your go-to kind of thing to investigate and if find out how to fix? Yeah, if something looks off, I'm, I usually try to find two or three other reasons to fix it before I make any move. Like it's possible that if my head looks too wide, it might be that it's too short, right? So yeah. um, especially on day two, I'm really... I guess, apprehensive about making any impulsive changes on a drawing. Yeah, I can't tell you how often we'll be problem solving either like independently or together. And we'll just be like, God, like this just seems so long or this seems so squished. Um, and then it ends up being that maybe it's not the length that was the issue, but it was a width issue. There's other elements that are making another component in the drawing feel a certain way. So yeah, if there's anything that needs to be changed, we really want to back up why. So we do have some people tuning in. We have some um, worldwide watchers at the moment um, from Kyrgyzstan. We have a viewer, he says, hello. So we got a Hi. lot of 
viewers from <laughs> worldwide. Yeah, good morning to some of you. Good evening to some of you. It's so great to have you guys back here for the second day. Thank you for tuning in. We have Kristen from Newport, Rhode Island. Um, so if you guys are viewing right now, feel free to drop in the live chat where you're from and yeah, what's going on? Um, we have a question and they say, are you still thinking in terms of plumb lines and angles at this point? Or at this point, should you be mostly locked in on your proportions? Portions are mostly locked in, but it's always a, um, I guess, a process of refining towards that pinpoint specificity. Um, things could still move a little bit. When I left, I thought the eyes might be a hair too far apart, and they don't yet agree on a, um, like a, a parallel yet. So I want to fix that before I decide that anything is locked in. I'm just trying to look at the skull as a whole right now and see if there's anything major that I have to change. All right, so we have some people from Brazil. We have Kevin from Brazil. Um, Sheila from Maine, she says, thanks so much for making this workshop online. Mm -hmm. um, Anna from Argentina. Ethan from Connecticut, Gwen from Houston. Um, she says, howdy. And yeah, more people are coming in. So um, feel free to drop where you are because it's really interesting to hear where everyone's watching from. We have a question from Paul. Um, when you both got to GCA, did you find that you had to unlearn stuff like ditching previous ha habits? If so, can mm -hmm. you describe a few? Oh, this is, that's a good one. I'm still ditching habits. <laughs> I mean, the big one that everyone comes in at GCA is learning how to think sculpturally rather than optically. And that's, it's like training a muscle you didn't know you have. And that just takes a really long time to recognize how and when you're doing it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I guess oh another gosh. bad habit I've unlearned, I'm still trying to unlearn, is going back. So a big thing that Jacob says at GCA is just don't go back. Commit to your best attempt first. So if I'm modeling the forehead all day, I want to be as careful as I can that every note I put down is as correct as it can be because if I go back and try to redo it while it's wet, thinking I can do it better, usually it gets worse. And um, you kind of lose that freshness of the paint. Yeah, the vitality of the first decisions. Um, yeah, you can lose that really quickly. Um, and when you say that you're modeling the forehead, for example, mm -hmm. um, could you just describe how you would explain modeling? Because we did have a few questions of people just wanting to know what that would be. Sure. Um, the way that we draw, which should be pretty clear by now, is that we separate the block-in phase where you're searching and placing all the lines in light and shadow. That's separate from the modeling stage, which is when you're actually like laying down value to describe form and volume. And um, I don't know, I find it helpful to separate the two so that you can bring your entire energy and focus to each independently. So modeling is just really shading. Um, and when we say modeling specifically, shading to us means describing volume by using value. So we have some more people who are saying where they're watching from. We have someone from Vegas, uh, Sweden, Quebec, 
Um, we have someone from India who is studying at the Barcelona Academy of Art, which is very cool to hear. Mm -hmm. We have a Florence, Italy viewer um, and Guatemala. So quite the mm -hmm. bunch. I just think it's so cool how we can have everyone here like watching globally what you guys are doing and just have access to your teachings. It's so nice to have that accessibility. Yeah, seriously, it's amazing to be able to connect with people in this way. Um, gosh, I'm so grateful for the people that we've met. Um, and hearing everyone signing in, you know, some people that are here, it's our friends that we've had, you know, from college <laughs> um, before even starting this uh, journey in New York. And then um, some people are friends that we've made online, either through Instagram or from meeting at doing workshops or, you know, online teaching and, and to be able to just connect with each other over this shared passion has been such an amazing ride. I think these live streams have kind of been one of the good things to come from the COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. Like a few years ago, we would never really be able to have something like this. It just wasn't easily accessible. So it's like kind of a silver lining out of everything that's happened. Yeah. Yeah, weirdly, right? Man, habits. Um, that was a great question. I feel like um, so much of trying to learn how to draw and paint has been a matter of finding a balance between um, submitting to process, um, this choice to submit to process, submit to you know a master painters and draftsmen of choice, um, and but finding the balance between what feels like a suppression of self, um, a suppression, like suppression of your own curiosities. Um, I think that's a struggle a lot of people have is to what extent are my sort of, um, what's the difference between a, a really f a fruitful submission um, and a suppression? And I think um, that's been a really interesting thing to try to navigate. Um, I know a lot of people are sort of frustrated by that. Um, but I feel like in starting this, um, there's been this huge amount of relief in exploring some of these concepts and sort of learning what it is to let go of my own ego as I'm trying to navigate the skill set and understanding nature and putting that forward, um, there's almost been more freedom in being able to allow myself to come out along the way in ways that I may, maybe didn't anticipate, I guess, um, that loss of the idea of losing creativity or losing your own voice along the way really seemed to not even be a, an issue. <laughs> I think like our, our own voices, our own perspectives, our own sense of self and the way that we navigate and process um, the world as well as our own like emotional journey and, and trying to make art is always inherently there. Like for better and for worse, you can't get rid of that. That's just gonna, it's like a, a, the way that you speak is an influence of, of all of your experiences and all of the, you know, cadences and, and slang, like it all comes out, you know? Um, but the sort of like learning to just relinquish myself along the way has also like, God, it sounds so ridiculously cheesy, but you kind of meet yourself at the same time once you choose to let it go, the idea of it, the fear of it. Um, and that's been a really, really satisfying experience and journey. Yeah, you said that beautifully. So we have um, a question about the materials 
that you guys are using. Um, they're wondering if you're still using the Blackwing and Tyler, if you're still using the 2H for the stage of the drawing. Yeah, I did switch to the 2H. Um, I, I grabbed the 2H because I want to get a little bit more specific now and the harder graphite allows for that. Yeah, um, and I'm also using a mix of a, a harder and the softer pencil as well. Do you guys have any experience with um, like mechanical pencils? Is there a reason why you prefer to use the wooden ones? I used to use mechanical pencils a lot or like those lead holders. I just like the weight of these regular pencils better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, um, I like using the mechanical pencils if I'm like, sketching from memory or from like at a museum or something and there's the convenience factor of being able to like slide the lead down and put it away um and not have to worry about sharpening myself for a while um but when it comes to like sitting down and making a drawing um it'll be over a more extended period of time and i want more control and nuance often i just yeah the same reason the i like the the weight of the pencil um but the wooden the wooden pencil um, more for whatever reason. So we have some more people that are saying where they're from. We have um, Israel, Toronto, Canada, um, and Madrid, Spain. And they're all saying thank you for day two and they're really enjoying it so far. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Sean. Um, do you think that focusing exclusively on drawing from life and limiting or removing photo references altogether is important for development and learning how to draw in this style? Um, yeah, to, to whatever you're capable of um, with access to models or even still lifes or anything. Um, I mean, I think both of us at this stage of our careers are pretty committed to working from life without any digital intervention. Um, not in any holier than that way. It's just uh, kind of the, the thing we do. We, we, I think we're both interested in making objects that are a response to nature rather than just uh, a snapshot of an image. And I mean, yeah, I do think that working from life teaches you to translate what you're seeing into a language rather than copying details. Um, it certainly helps you understand color and light better when you're not just drawing from an image. Yeah. Um, and also too, I mean, a, a big, Another component of that is the the artwork of the past that we're hoping to have a, a contemporary dialogue with in the work that we're to make, you know, within the next five years and in a lifetime is in communication with work that was also made from life. And that has its own sort of visual language. Um, and set of problem solving tools, um, there's a certain, and it's also a part of the, the artifice itself, like the act, the method of making it is also the, the art. Um, it gives the result of the art. And, um, 
I think there, there's a significant difference in that. Um, All right, so we're at our first model break. So we're going to be taking a five minute break and we will be back shortly. All right, we are back. Um, so this is our second session on day two for the portrait drawing workshop. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll be answering them as the workshop goes on. So we do have some more questions. We have a question from Mustafa. He says, hi from Egypt. Uh, hi. In some of your drawings, you make the reflected light lighter than your half tone. How do you control that and not disturb the form? Um, if I ever do that, that might be uh, like an, an issue in the photograph. I'm, I'm pretty deliberate about minimizing reflected light as much as I can because it's this light and shadow that I'm concerned with. Reflected light is just incidental. Chelsea, we had a few people that really resonated with your um, talking about how like you follow your voice and kind of um, working with that as an artist. Um, Ethan says, I love that idea of who you are inherently as a creator, always being there for better or for worse. I've made pretty tight drawings, but always felt feel like I just have to let go and let it rip. Yeah. Let it rip. It's funny, I, I think I'm kind of the opposite where you just you're spend four years in a room with your peers and I can get influenced by Chelsea being looser in painting and then that makes me think I should be looser. But I don't know, now that I'm making my own work, I'm just letting paintings become what they are. And I just, I just happen to paint in a higher resolution than some people. And, I mean, Van Eyck makes beautiful paintings and his are pretty, pretty high red. So there's historical precedent for everything. Yeah, uh, that was a huge thing. Um, and just starting out was that comparison. Um, you're always watching the person next to you. You're each trying to problem solve together. Um, and Tyler, like while we're more similar than we are different in our, our process, you know, relatively speaking, um, our intuitions and our, our general natures are really kind of opposite. Um, and that has come down to even the little things. And there were so many days where I would watch, cause he's been ahead of me. He's been the one, um, just that little bit ahead of me, like every step of the game. And so I've always been watching him and watching his hand, watching his handling. Um, and every time that I've tried to make myself emulate exactly his turn of the brush or his particular way of modeling. Um, I'm much more planar in the way that I come at form. He's much more curvilinear. It exists in the, in the round before it exists in these like big, like blocky planes and I'm the opposite blocky planes. And then, you know, then we like carve out the curvilinear from there. That's just how my brain works like for better and for worse. And in every way that I tried to force myself to be, like Tyler's brush stroke. It, I swear to you, like <laughs> trying to make yourself be anybody else, there's always friction. And the second I let go of that and I found like the nucleus of the concepts that we were both trying to get at and not literally mimicking anybody else's hand, um, that's when the flow started. That's when it was like, okay, that's the relinquishing of the ego. That's the relinquishing of the self. It's about the concept. Um, and that's actually like a huge misconception in trying a lot of people trying to learn this is that there's this fixation on like the level of resolution, the perfection that like one perfect line is the thing. Um, and it's not, there's people, I mean, especially in a school like GCA, there's this massive range of how people are articulating the form concept. Like what, on the one hand we have Devin Cecil wishing who has these like 
magnificent, beautiful, perfect gradients, super, super high resolution form. And right next to him with the same exact form concept thinking is Travis Schlott and, you know, Colleen Berry, this very like architectural planar building of like activity that is still using that form vehicle, that form concept. Um, and so there's this massive range that often is like a resolution discrepancy and not a right way to perform discrepancy. Um, and so that's like a huge personality thing that every single one of us has had to grapple with. Um, you know, I'm, we're both blessed to have gone to GCA and Jacob Collins is one of the most influential instructors I've ever had. And I've also not met many instructors that are as disinterested in talking about technique. <laughs> um, and one of the best pieces of advice I got from him was always pursue and never flee. So if you find yourself, your inner voice making decisions saying like, oh, I don't want to paint like that guy or I don't want people to think this about me. I got to do the other thing. He says, that's the wrong voice. You got to listen to the voice that's telling you to pursue what you actually care about. So there's kind of like a, a letting go. And then when you're actually just painting and being really honest with yourself, I think that's when you make the best work. Yeah, totally. I, um, there's a, a friend of mine is um, a really amazing abstract painter named Betsy Eby, and we were talking about something similar of this sort of like relinquishing and, and being along for the ride. And she laughed and was like, oh my gosh, well, like often I, I joke or, or her and her husband joke that painting is like riding the whale. Like the painting is going to go where the painting needs to go and you're just along for, for the ride. Like, hang on, commit, do it. But like, so often we don't get to dictate exactly what this thing is going to be. Um, and I really, really love that. That's something I've been holding on to. So it was mentioned earlier um, where someone said where you are in your career right now. Um, and someone is asking, you're thinking about it in stages. Do you kind of think about your career like that? Like where it's like you're in the beginning, the middle, and then the more advanced part. And do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Lewis and I were talking last night about this book called Mastery by Robert Greene. And in the book, he kind of outlines along a 10 year journey towards mastery. You can break that down into three phases. Our training at GCA was the first phase, the apprenticeship phase, where you're just learning your, your prerequisite skills. And I really feel like I'm in the second phase now, the creative active phase, where you are experimenting and applying those skills, seeing what works and what doesn't, what truly interests you and what doesn't. And um, I mean, on a more realistic note, my only plan right now uh, it's so complicated turning this into a career. So since we're financially afloat from doing this, my only concern is like, let's make 10 paintings that excite me and just see what happens. Um, I mean, that's really it. At the end of the day, all you're trying to do is afford to be able to paint as often as you can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we're both, we both got to a point where we were like, okay, this is going to be a long game. This is not a, for both of us, we were not, never interested in this being a like fame overnight journey. Like that's just not what interests us. And we knew that if we wanted to reach a certain ability or competency, like it was all going to just take a long time. And that was something that we acknowledged from the beginning that we would just kind of be along for a ride that was going to take a little bit longer. Um, and we're very much we definitely had a cer certain number of phases in mind. <laughs> um, this is something that we kind of talk about a lot at East Oaks 
is like the kind of goal setting, like finding mm -hmm. goals for yourself. Um, like some people are definitely more analytical, like they like to plan everything out like to the day. Um, and some people are a little bit more go with the flow. Um, is that how you guys kind of approach your career in any way? I'm pretty analytical, yeah. Okay. <laughs> And we're learning this year that as much as we can plan, there's always going to be something that sort of takes you uh, away I'm, from that plan. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, back on track to another one, which often ends up being better than the one you initially planned out. Um, but all it's a really interesting dance between control and relinquishing control. I will say that I've, by design, I do not have a plan for my work right now. Um, to be candid, I've, we've set our lives up so that teaching kind of covers our entire cost of living and then some so that we can spend all of our time painting without the pressure of surviving off of sales. And when you free yourself from that pressure, you're able to, I guess, take risks or paint things that might not sell. And um, it's been a really interesting exploration for me into what it truly means to paint honestly. Well, in the realm of like talking about working and like sales and planning and things like that, um, can you share the measures you take to keeping good health mentally and physically as an artist? <laughs> like, I know it's a very physical job. Yeah, I'm not you're the working... person to ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's been um, really difficult because actually before we moved and, and started doing this full time, we were like fairly active people. Um, we both grew up with our own, you know, commitment to something athletic and, um, we were outdoors constantly and, uh, we're definitely, if there's anything that we lament is kind of that we did choose to kind of sacrifice the amount of activity that we were once used to, um, and staying fit, but also putting like, I mean, because we're in the studio from eight o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night and sometimes later every day, yeah, it's, except maybe Sundays. <laughs> um, it's a lot. It's... And we, we teach on top of our, our daily studio practice. And um, there's not a lot of time for anything else at this point. Um, and uh, we, we have no regrets with that, but it's certainly been a compromise. And, you know, after five plus years, there's certain things where we're like, oh, wow, you know, this really was a compromise, wasn't it? <laughs> we're a little more achy than we once were. Uh, we're not spring chickens. Um, we do prioritize eight hours of sleep. Um, yeah. Like, no matter what. Yeah, that's not something we're not willing to compromise on is, is good sleep. Um, yeah, that's been no joke. <laughs> Getting good sleep, maintaining sanity. Um, keeping good neuroplasticity has been something that we've read a lot about um, uh, for, from, you know, statistics on high performance across many different fields. And, um, you know, our, our diet and our sleep has been something that we, we felt that we could control that was regardless of, of time, that was what we could control the most. Um, and so we're really big on uh, our diet and sleep and basic health in that way. And also meditation too for mental health. Like I mean, not to be like one of those people that's like, it changed my life, but it kind of did change my life in a lot of ways, um, for just maintaining peace of mind and managing stress. Like that was, that was a huge, huge thing for me in managing anxiety. Um, um, just from my own standards of performance that I want for myself. Um, and also, you know, maintaining upping the workload each year, there's just been a gradual increase. Um, and 
that's stressful. I mean, life is stressful. So I think finding ways to cope and not just, you know, freak out all the time <laughs> on your loved ones and your peers and, you know, and not let that affect the work too. I mean, like good work is not made from a place of, of, you know, fight or flight mode. So you have to figure out what you need to do for yourself and take that seriously. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize how much your mental health can really impact your work. Like totally. if you're just having a bad a bad mindset, then most of the time your work is not going to turn out the best that you can make. Mm -hmm. It's just so important to actually take care of yourself in that way. Totally. Totally. I feel like our in our early years of doing this, we were just like, yeah, brute force, like as many hours as possible, like everything, like suppress everything else. Like we're willing to give up everything. Um, we shaved it down to a healthy 13 a day. Yeah. And we shaved it down to a healthy 13 a day. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that's, I mean, that's largely too, because we were anticipating that we would only have like, this time is precious. This amount of time, being able to put this amount of time in, was not going to be forever. Um, and so we really wanted to capitalize on the, the what, what has been a real like blessing of time and resources. It's not something that we had for a long time, not something we had access to for a long time, something that a lot of people don't have access to. And we're not willing to take that for granted. And you also mentioned that you're teaching like on top of your normal regular painting and drawing. Um, do you find that that affects your work also? Like does teaching, it kind of hones your skill. I think we talked about this yesterday. Do you find that it affects it in any other way? Um, I teach first year drawing at GCA on Fridays all day. And I was teaching cast drawing the first half of the year. And when you show up at 8.30 and you're expected to sit down and have answers to such incredible drawings, um, it kind of feels like doing like 16 really hard chess puzzles all day. Mm -hmm. And then you find out that you're saying the same four things and then you walk away at the end of the day saying, well, wait, I need to do those four things too. <laughs> so I do think that I learned more about form and the way that we're talking about it from teaching cast drawing than I did through the eight cast drawings that I had done. So it's a really tremendous help. It really reorganizes uh, what you think and know to be important in drawing. Did you always have an interest in teaching or was it something that kind of just you had the opportunity to do and you figured might as well try it? I think it certainly started out as like a, um, like a way to stay afloat through doing mm -hmm. this because sales are inconsistent. But um, I mean, teaching is a little bit more controllable. And the more that we've done it, the more that it's become clear how gratifying it is. Yeah. Yeah, because I think, I mean, like, we're all human, right? And there's so many days where we're like, oh, like, I just want to be painting. I just want to be painting. And then the second you get in and start working with people, it's so fulfilling and so much fun that you're like, okay, this, this, is, this is good. I'm so glad that I get the chance to be able to do this and sustain myself on, on something that's so gratifying. Um, and yet what Tyler said about it really making you – double down on yourself in the studio is so true <laughs> so many times you walk in and you come up to your own work after and you're like wait am i doing that thing because it really doesn't look like it right now <laughs> <laughs> need to take some of my own advice from two hours ago i remember in college especially and shortly after before we made the move to new york i was just so desperate for any of this information on how to draw and there really were no resources, even though we only lived two hours from New York City, it just seemed so far away. And um, I just really have a vested interest in helping people not feel that way. Yeah.
All right, so we are going to be taking a five minute model break. So we will be back in about five minutes. And as always, just feel free to put some questions in the comments and we'll ask, answer them in the next session. All right, we are back from our model break. Um, so to start off, we do have a question. This is regarding um, the recent art auction that was really big. Um, it had a Cesar Santos painting and they were just wondering what is the impact that these art auctions could have on contemporary painters? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Oh God. Hard that to say. Is, that's a rabbit hole right there. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's hard to say. <laughs> I didn't talk very well. Um, I don't know that I've ventured an opinion on that yet. Um, gosh, let me think about that for a second. so tricky to um have an opinion about that because the market especially the market in that territory is is so big <laughs> and it's so volatile um, that predicting it is really so complicated. And so much of that is also like dependent on and influenced by and influences the zeitgeist overall. And I think, God, I, there's just no way to understand where that's going. Um, unless you're, if you're the 1% of the 1% and you're a part of who's actually influencing that, then sure, maybe you have an idea of where that truly is going. But even the people in it, like even the people working in blue chip galleries, half the time they don't know what the hell is going to happen with that um, a year from now or even two months from now. And um, that's a really complicated thing. I think there's parts of it that are hopeful. There's parts of it that are disheartening. Um, it's a really, really com complicated conversation. Um, something we talk about quite often, sometimes in optimistic ways and sometimes in pessimistic ways. Um, I think our opinion about that changes day to day. <laughs> our relationship doing this to the culture at large, the contemporary culture at large is really a huge conversation that <clears throat> has a lot of factors that we don't have any control over. Um, I have a pretty solemn resolve that um, we are not going to change the art market. It's, it's too large. There's, there's too much invested in it as a machine. Um, in our circle in New York, especially at GCA, we talk a lot about um, just creating an art market, like a, a little bubble. It doesn't have to be a big one, but um, just enough to develop some kind of connoisseurship around what we do. Um, I mean, it's, it's a lot of energy that you might waste trying to get your work in front of people that just don't care about it. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I think most we're at this time right now, the most interested in cultivating relationships with people in the here and now that have shared values, um, have shared interests in, in art making and, and um, committing our time to that, I think, uh, as opposed to committing energy to something that's so socially oriented, the social hierarchy involved in all of that is such a game unto itself. Um, and it's, it's just so volatile that that's just not where we're willing to put our energy right this second. Um, cultivating the relationships in the here and now is a little bit more um, on the forefront of where we're at. 
I think this goes back to the honesty question as well. Like if you're, if you're, I guess, chasing a market, especially one like the art market, which isn't necessarily the most honest game that's being played. I don't know. I, I think you're better off just worrying about making the most sincere work you can and then people will show up for it. What, uh, this is Lewis here, everyone. Uh, what, what was the exact question on the auction? So they were wondering um, what we think about the recent art auction of Cesar Santos, which the actual auction was um, Bouguereau and his circle, and it included a few contemporary artists with no connection to the school of Bouguereau, but kind of had the same realm of the teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, I think according to what they're all talking about is the responsibility of not having to be distracted or focused on the auction side of things but according to what i'm reading into the question is do we feel like it is a positive or a negative um thing for what kind of work we create so and i think just as everything that we have in life there it's a double-edged sword for thinking about how it helps or hurts uh, what we do and that's, I think that's what they're getting out when they're saying it's quite complicated because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different ways that things are being influenced one way or the other. I would say one of the positive ways that it seems to be influencing the art market, if we were to have any value put onto the work that is monetary, which is not necessarily a large concern as an art creator uh, for the monetary value, except for the for the form of being a professional and making sure that you can do it, do a quality thing for uh, your profession and living. So there has to be some amount of monetary exchange that is worth something. But um, at with the art market at large, there is a part of it that is uh, creating it to be in public domain. And by having a public domain number that is started, starting to be tied to it, allows there to be precedent to create a foundation monetarily to the public so that they can you can start building on the idea of a value in a higher level of of um, like we're saying the one percenters and trying to create value in a certain direction so it would be like participating in a field where institutions have been established realizing that you're not going to nearly compete to whatever the pop market and pop art market or the contemporary art world is is having going on at large but um but i do believe that it allows for people to start like museums and other institutions to be able to say okay there's attention that's being drawn to this that is that's worth us paying attention to and i think that's what creates a foundational institution to start being built similar to like a new Salem is um, you need about three different, three different angles for people to show value in art. And it's not necessarily the artist's responsibility to do that. So I agree with them that they should not be thinking about it. They should be, it's hard enough to think about creating incredibly truthful and intentional work, but to have advocates in fields like that, I think is advantageous for, the art market at large for us to for people to say hey there's something being done that is a value here um so that's one small optimistic side there is most certainly uh a corrupt side of it that i don't particularly care for um and is quite frustrating but um it hopefully if you do, if done correctly by advocates that care or also the advocates that understand how to to do it in an ethical way that will hopefully establish a much stronger foundation to build upon. Thank you, Lewis. I don't think I've ever heard somebody say that, <laughs> articulate <laughs> that so um, clearly um, from, you know, multiple vantage points. That was really perfect. Thank you. You're welcome.
Well, after that discussion, we have Mark. He asks, will you ever return to do an in-person workshop at, at East Oak Studios? We were just talking about that this morning. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been a, a nothing but a wonderful experience. And we're really, um, really grateful for our relationships here at East Oaks. Um, this has been really, really great. And we would absolutely be interested in, in returning. And... and we would love for them to come back. So they're so busy, though, we'll have to work on like 2029. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. These two are in high demand these days. Lewis has been trying to convince us to move down here and he thinks we don't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a whole lot of gaslighting just being like, what, what are you talking about? This is great. <laughs> this is amazing. You don't see it. <laughs> oh my God. But he's doing a great job because uh, it's, it's certainly in the running for where we'll head next. I mean, it worked on me. I'm from <laughs> Chicago, so <laughs> he's he's doing it. <laughs> I think maybe he's paid by the city of Raleigh. <laughs> it's recruiting. I'm the head of the art, the Raleigh Arts Council. I just haven't told anyone yet. <laughs> well, we were talking earlier about like setting goals and things like that. So we have a question from Benjamin. Um, he says, I just completed my first year as a full-time artist, hit all my financial goals, but I'm having trouble setting goals for this year. Do you have any advice or how you would handle it? I don't know that I do because I'm in the same boat. <laughs> Reassessing goals. Oh, man. I feel like season by season and year by year, we both make time to reassess the goals. Literally writing it down. Um, keeping that sheet of paper having the calendars out, checking in with the, what those yearly goals were. If you met them, awesome. How did it feel? <laughs> Are you happy with that? Was that satisfying? Did it, did it feed you in the way that you hoped it would? Um, and if not, why? And articulating that to ourselves. Um, that's something we, we haven't, that's something that we like to not slack on is, is, maybe uh, every six months to a year reassessing and checking in with what those goals were, um, putting time into that. So I guess deciding exactly what, in what way you could be reassessing is, is like really particular to what your own goals are. But um, I guess making the time to actually reflect on how you felt about the, the goal making or, or lack of hitting certain points and trying to understand why maybe one worked and one didn't um is really worth your time i don't know i don't know that i can say anything more than that but something that i found really useful for setting goals because i'm like very much an analytical planner um but i love using notion which is a it's a website and it's basically like a journal and you can add like a, bun a bunch of to-do lists and calendars and charts and like anything you can or want to do. Um, and something that I found really useful is to split goals up into quarters. So like for the year of 2023, you'll split it up into three quarters. And then for each quarter, you'll have your goals and then not only goals, but your tasks as to how you're going to complete those goals. So as you kind of organize throughout the quarter, you can cross off things that you have done and have gotten complete. And if for some reason you weren't able to complete that goal or that task, then you just move it over to the next quarter in 2023. Um, and I found that really useful because 
there are certain times where I'm like, I can't paint, I can't draw, but I can plan. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I found really useful. So it's called Notion. It's free. This is not sponsored. It's just like, I really <laughs> like it. <laughs> so it's, it's worth checking out if you ever need something like that. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. That's so great. Yeah, something I love about Tyler's personality is he's really good at setting, like seeking goals, like from the lofty to the more maybe arguably reasonable. Um, and then not only setting those goals, but then saying, what are the stepping stones to get me where I am right now to that thing? Like, it's one thing to set the goals, another thing to know how you're spending tomorrow to get to it. Um, and he is really good at understanding like, okay, this is next week's goal, then next month, two months, three months. Um, and being like really, really uh, blunt and candid with yourself on how you're contending with that goal. Like what is, where is your work at? What are your problems? What are your strengths? Um, and not beating around the bush at all um, about it, I think is something I admire in his um, ability and personality. And that's something that I learned a lot um, from him. And it's really important to like hold yourself accountable to that. Yeah. Because it's so easy to say, oh, I want, I want this goal to happen. Like I want to create like 10 paintings, but to actually create tasks that will delegate and make sure you actually complete that goal is really important. And I feel like it kind of falls on the wayside but you do need to really make sure you stick to it, which is honestly, I think that's the hardest part. You can set as many goals as you want, but actually getting it done is way more challenging. <laughs> that's so true. Like all the time we joke like, oh yeah, that's a great thing for tomorrow me to do. Like tomorrow <laughs> me is gonna love this. This is awesome. Um, but actually holding yourself accountable to just like getting into the weeds and getting it done, whether you love it or hate it. Like there's so much that is not always fun to have to sort out. And, um, but you know what? The first 15 minutes of getting into the weeds is the hardest part of anything. And I feel like half the time, once you're in it, you're like, oh my God, I feel so much better. This is great. This isn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. These people are amazing. Like, what was I so afraid of? What was the problem? Or even like working out, like everyone jokes that the hardest part is getting to the gym. Once you're in the workout, you're like, you get in a flow, you at least do enough to stay there and then leave afterwards and have felt some amount of accomplishment and every drop in the bucket counts. So really like holding yourself accountable to just show up for yourself is so much of moving forward. We have a bit more of a like a technical question, but um, if you guys could talk about drawing a portrait with the intention to then create it into a painting, um, how far do you take it before you were to say make it into a painting, or maybe if you want to go over like do you have like a process as to like transferring or things like that? Uh, I posted a drawing on my Instagram a few weeks ago of a portrait. I was looking up at him. His name is Ashari. And I, I drew that one as if I was drawing to block in for a painting. I'm less concerned with aesthetics and just more concerned with just specificity and delineation. Um, something I like to do on a, a block in for a painting is I'll just circle the highlights and then transfer those. Um, they're they're kind of just uglier drawings a little bit. They're more like blueprints. It's like boundaries, structure, proportion, good, okay. Like that's enough of a blueprint of information to be able to paint on. And it's like often far less an artifact, like the intention for this to be more than just a, a drafting process to be, a, you know, a little code book for me to be able to traverse and paint. Um, They're much less delicate. Yeah. Um, 
And then we've transferred for paintings in a couple of different ways, like in, and most often we'll do like an oil transfer. Um, oh God, that's like a whole conversation uh, in itself though. Um, I don't know if people feel like listening to that, but <laughs> maybe they do. Maybe people would want to hear about the process of transferring for a painting and things like that, but. I can run through it fast, but I'll only say it once. <laughs> Yeah. So you get your drawing Xeroxed, scaled up or down to the size you want on the painting. On the back of the Xerox, you just use like a stiff brush to rub oil paint in. We usually use like raw umber, Van Dyke Brown. Mm -hmm. um, you will fight the material a little bit because you can't really predict how the oil is going to behave. So sometimes we have to add a little bit of linseed oil. Um, and you're, you're really rubbing it into the paper so that... Um, I guess it's just the film on the back. Tape it to the canvas, make sure it's plumb, make sure it's where you want it, and then you just use a ballpoint pen, trace over the lines. When I do it, I'm extremely deliberate that every single line that I'm tracing over, I'm referring to my drawings so that the intention stays as true as it first did. Um, and then that's that. And always, I'm going to add that always be in in the understanding that you will lose some bit of information, even at your like most intentional, just because it's not the most perfect, perfect ballpoint pin that's going to give you the like exact, exact line. So um, just, just know that going in that you're just going to take some time for you to understand that there's going to be a, just a slight bit of divergence that you might have to like do a hint of correcting um, it was good that you said that you're like full, so intentional about making sure it's exactly the line that you're trying to put down uh, to transfer over because um, that is, that's always such a difficult part of it. And you worked so hard for that um, fact finding too. Not just like throwing the baby out with the bathwater for the sake of getting the transfer done fast. All right, we're going to take a five minute model break. So uh, as always, feel free to leave your questions and then when we resume, we'll be answering them. Um, so we haven't really been talking about how the drawings are going. So if anyone wants to kind of share their thoughts on what they're working on right now? Sure, I've been procrastinating on this eye, so I need to just be an adult and get it done. Same. And uh, as I say that, I'm not working on the eye. <laughs> I'm still uh, fussing with pushing the jawline back. Um, but I too will be soon holding myself accountable for messing with the eye. Maybe. That'll be for my uh, self 20 minutes from now. She's going to love that. Is that usually something that is like a struggle point for you, like the eyes? Or is there like a different feature that is usually gives you trouble? Mouths are pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I mentioned to you guys on the break, I'm just really trying to... Um, not symbolize the eye, that funny word again. And um, yeah, if I can if I can start a drawing or any part of a drawing by breaking it down into just flat light and shadow, such as the nose right here, I didn't even put in the bridge of the nose. Um, you kind of arrive at naturalism through that abstraction. And for me, that abstraction is light and shadow. But then comes the process of actually articulating what's happening. And it's, it's really hard to hold on to that naturalism as you start articulating features like eyes. So I'm just trying to be really patient with how I break this down. Also, I think both of us get a little anxious about articulating the eyes, just because the eyes are such a huge psychological 
uh, component in the drawing and, and portraiture and there's I don't know it can be stressful it's it's something that when it feels off it feels really off um and so it's it's always funny trying to get yourself to just jump in the water and and yeah you're you're with it. with eyes especially in drawing this size like the size of my hand you're accountable for like lines with measurements and those can make or break uh like the naturalism of a drawing so you just have to be really deliberate. Yeah. I feel like often what I'm thinking about, like when finding likeness is how they talk about in movies, like suspending disbelief, like we're building an illusion and um, some version of her and so often like finding the likeness, finding the particularity of all the moments Tyler was just referencing, just how minute um, of an adjustment can affect the entire thing and like make or break it. So often I'm like, oh my gosh, what's, you know, if my drawing isn't quite feeling like her, like what's the truth and what's the lie? And like, what's the thing that's like maybe suspending disbelief here and how do I push that further and, and um, I don't know. It's just, it's hard. Hi, everybody. This is Evie. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a follow up question based on that, Chelsea. Um, yesterday, yesterday, you mentioned um, something about like the spiritual experience um, or aspect of art making. And uh, in a line with trying to capture like the soul or the essence or the the identity and core of a of a person, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about uh, what that experience is like for you and how your thought processes, spiritually, emotionally, um, physically, like when when working on trying to capture that? Um, I would say a, a part of that for me, honestly, is. Um, when I was a little bit earlier on, like a lot of my my habits and getting started, I was just so aware of like the timers running. The person next to me is getting going. Like they move so much faster than I do. They're already covering so much ground. And like, I got to get going. Like I can't keep, you know, no hesitation. Go, go, go. And, um, and for a while, if I just forced myself to dive in without taking a minute, um, to really read the room, read the person, like observe the person. Um, I was really unhappy with my work. And when I started, I remember I got to a point like maybe two years ago now where we would get started each day and the timer would be running, everyone would be going. And I would just let myself, I would look at my, my watch and I would say, okay, you have three minutes. Let's just put like a time frame on it. Three minutes to just sit and patiently observe. See, see this person. Don't just jump in and say, like, all right, time to measure right off the bat. Let's go. Let's like, you know, uh, how do I actually just see who they are? Um, observe those qualities that we talked about yesterday. Like, what sort of repeating motifs do I see? Like, what's their energy? Do they seem tense? Do they seem, you know, is there like a bravado to the way that they're like stretching their shoulders open? Um, how do they seem to be wanting to carry themselves? Like there's so much that you can read in a person if you just take the time to see them. Um, like for instance, we have two male models that we're working with at school right now that have so much bravado. They have so much, um, self-respect and they have such a way of wanting to project themselves um which in some ways is a bit performative but it's also deeply authentic to their personalities um and so much of that is the difference between a model who comes up and is maybe more serene and quiet and there's maybe like a little like this feeling of withdrawing into themselves and like a slackness to their shoulders and a, a like a 
a sleepiness to their expression. And there's something that you can glean in your drafting that's going to represent that. Um, and in contrast, someone like the models we're working with now who have this strong, like super um, outward expression of like, this like super like masculine energy, that's the stretching open of the chest. That's the slight lift in the chin. That's like this downward gaze that's like really, you know, strong and decisive draft it's like not just necessarily a measurement that's going to get you that feeling um and in a lot of ways it's a measurement that's going to get the truth of that you need both but i think there's a lot that can go unseen that can create a weakness in work um i think um so creating space like setting the stage to perform and having the patience to set that up and not just run into the room and just like mad dash, start slapping things down, um, I think is really, really important. Um, and that can come down to a feeling that might feel a little bit more spiritual. It might just feel like, or you could feel like a surgeon in that way. You could be like, I want everything to have a place. I want everything to be ready. That readying, like whether it feels spiritual or otherwise, like I think that readying is really important. And ritual can be really important in that. I mean, from music you're listening to, to the way that you set up your stand, even in a communal space, the way that you set up your space, I think ritual is important. It's almost like a, a bit of self-respect to be able to ready yourself. Self-respect and respect for people in the room with you I think that has a huge impact on the work. Huge. Well, that's a really good segue to one question that we have. Um, it's a bit of a heavy question, they said, but um, do you reckon all works of art need to possess a uh, physiological core? Or how do you prioritize building a poetic presence in all work, even as in studies? Hmm. I don't think that all works necessarily have to be, you know, beautiful or all works have to be. There's a beauty and ugliness too, though. That's a tricky one. Yeah, I, think... I think it's important we make the distinction between beauty and prettiness. Um, like Katie Colwitz's work is certainly beautiful, but you might not call it pretty. Um, and yeah, what is that quality? We've talked about it quite a bit as being a sincerity of intention. Mm -hmm. That is the most, we think maybe the most important thing. Um, um, and that can look a lot of different ways, but you can certainly tell when it's not there. Um, but that's a really, that's a really tough and abstract question. Um, can you ask the question again? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think what they were generally trying to ask is, do you think that every work of art needs to have a, a deeper meaning? Like, does it need to have a philosophy behind it or can it just be art for the sake of art i believe in art for art's sake i mean i don't think you can point to any one of my paintings that has a particularly deep meaning um however what's non-negotiable for me is that i'm as sincere and genuine as i can in how i see the person that i'm painting like to to really truly see someone is to like really care and i think that shows through do you think that that is what the deep meaning is i'd like to think so yeah so that it actually does have meaning is just the fact that the meaning for you is that you are trying to find deep deep truth uh mm -hmm. from the person in your observation and trying to be as truthful as possible. Yeah, and that, that also ties into why it's so important to me that 
I mean, as long as I can afford to, I can work from life as much as possible because I mean, I'm, I'm more interested in painting or in this case, in drawing the experience of sitting with our model than I am the appearance of the model, if that makes sense. Um, I think that that depth really shines through when you're in person with someone as you're drawing them. Yeah, the relationship that can be had. Um, also, I think we don't always know what the intention is. It, I think a lot of times it starts from a felt place and there's sort of an impetus, a desire to go somewhere um, in the abstract visual experience of the thing. And then later often you can articulate the, the purpose. Um, I think it's our job to follow the inclination, follow the desire, commit, follow through. Um, and then as the works start to accumulate, the more prolific you are, then you can start to connect the dots. Um, and the more that you grow in your own, like, understanding of yourself and being able to self-actualize, like, then you can really start maybe putting some pieces together. And I think that maybe that sort of holistic approach can lead to some really, really amazing works of art. Often faster maybe than feeling like you have to make a statement and your job is to be the statement maker. Like often the statement is inherent in the desire, maybe. I think maybe that's how I'm starting to feel lately. Um, I don't think Van Gogh, like Van Gogh didn't want to look like Van Gogh, but he was Van Gogh. Like, <laughs> like he's, you know, I mean, look at his impact, but he hated in a lot of ways what his work looked like and this, this voice that he tried so hard to steer in a certain direction, but would we ever trade his output for maybe what he thought he wanted to be, you know? And that was true for so many artists. Um, so sometimes, God, we've been talking about Jacob so much, but like maybe this will be the last time I reference him yeah, <laughs> today. Is, um, but something that he says so often is he, you know, maybe it's not the artist's job to decide whether they were good or not. It's not our job to decide what the statement is supposed to be sometimes. Um, and I think, I think he's right. Cause I mean, we've all walked up and saw our friend's work and we're like, dude, what? Like, that's so good. What are you doing? And they're just like crumbling. They're like, oh my God, don't look at it. I hate this. This isn't doing the thing. It's not doing the thing. And you're just like, you know what? Maybe it's not your job to decide that. <laughs> Maybe you should just like go have a seat and uh, we'll all appreciate this amazing thing that you started building today. Come back when you got some emotional separation. <laughs> um, I don't know. So we have a question from Ellen, and I think this is a really good question that not a lot of artists are really talking about, but um, she's asking, would you address ways to eliminate feeling awkward working one-on-one -on -one with the model in your studio, or how are some ways that you find um, you can kind of make the model feel more comfortable, or just any advice on working with models one-on-one -on -one in your studio time? Are you comfortable right now? <laughs> <laughs> Um, sometimes it's just awkward. Like, I, I don't know. I've, I've been talking to Chelsea about how grateful I am right now that, uh, the three or four projects I have going, I'm, I'm working with models that are really deeply invested in the outcome of the project. And it's just so invigorating to connect with people like that. Um, and I mean, one project I'm working on, I, I think we're going on session, like, 14 right now so you get pretty comfortable with your model after a while yeah we spent a lot of time together um 
I think I'm like embracing in the beginning that it's awkward for everyone and like not feeling like, you know, either one of you is like causing a problem and just like acknowledging that it's just kind of like a weird thing that we're doing. Like, hey, come sit with me for four hours a day for a month. We're not really going to talk that much. Yeah, don't I'm talk. just going to stare at you. Um, it's not weird. This is There's nothing, you know, like strangely voyeuristic going on. Um, I do think it helps though to, um, the, the work is better when you, um, I guess really appreciate who the person is. Um, I mean, I've worked with some models that might have like the most striking portrait, but they're just not interested. And that always comes through in the work. I feel like a lot of artists are also mainly introverted. That's just kind of how we are with few exceptions. So when it comes to like having a model plus an introverted artist, it's like kind of a recipe for a little <laughs> awkward situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's nice to know that it's a very common thing. <laughs> totally. You know what's a good help? Um, paint a profile so they're not looking at you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I think it's just a good idea to make sure you are painting profiles. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people that, um, you know, get really good at doing <laughs> work, you know, with the person looking at you or somewhere in a more frontal direction. And then you find yourself handicapped. So it's good to even do that in general. Profiles yeah. are so deceptively difficult. You'd think that since you're only responsible for half of the features, it'd be easier, but you know, putting the filter in like one millimeter too far to the left could just destroy the portrait. This might be more of a general question, but um, we have a question from Sean. Uh, he says, how would you suggest someone approaching learning how to draw on the style if they don't have access to an atelier and with limited financial means, which is very common. Like we usually hear that a lot. It's just like some people mm -hmm. just don't have That's the means rough. to move to study wherever they want. So any yeah. advice on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, when I, when I started trying to draw like this, 2015, there was almost nothing on the internet, but now between like Stephen Bauman and East Oak Studios, there's just so many resources online. Um, most of my education, I guess self-taught education after college before GCA was just master copies. I did over a hundred portrait master copies from just masterpieces that I loved before I got to GCA and um, I mean, half of the work is just understanding the process. So you can learn the process from a trained artist and then execute that process from master copies. That'll go a long way. Yeah, um, that's so true. Plus all of us are so willing to share online if you just ask and a lot of us teach privately as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, to echo what Tyler said, the amount of resources available for free online now are just absolutely astounding. And to be able to do a master copy, just find like a decently high res, well, high enough resolution for you to be able to see what the application really looked like and not just be like so compressed that you can't make out brush strokes and things like that. That's like the code, like those are the cheat codes. You're allowed to be in communication with that for free. And um, really, really studying the work that you appreciate will bring you so far. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree, reaching out, 
making friends, putting an effort to cultivate relationships with people who care about what you care about will also get you so much further than you could imagine. Um, really cultivate those relationships where you can. And if you're in a place where you can afford to travel to workshops, I mean, that's how we started. And that went a really long way in the beginning. Yeah. And if you have any way at all of bartering too, like you would be surprised <laughs> like what you might have to offer to somebody who might be willing to sit and crit you. Um, yeah. Come pose for me. I'll gladly teach you how to draw. Yeah. We have so many friends who are teaching their models. Um, we have, you know, there's so many people who their profession is something that would be a desirable trade for some time. Um, if so, if you have a skill that you'd be able to sort of barter with, that's another option. It doesn't always have to be, you know, a cash trade for information. Um, it's, I don't know. It's, it's funny the, the things you can sort of come up with to be able to get access to what you, you want. Sometimes it's a little... Um, random or unconventional, but a lot of times people are willing to work things out. All right, we are gonna take our model break. So we're gonna do a five minute break and then we will be back shortly. Also, before we do, I just wanted to make an extra comment there, which is most of my GCA experience was bartered. So in, including the tuition. So, you know, may, they might, not have opportunities that just happened to be a very interesting, unique opportunity that I specialized in that allowed for us to make a barter trade that we could find a monetary value on. But to always try to seek an opportunity to find a need in order to do a barter setup. Um, because you can, it is amazing how much you can actually um, do with someone if you know what their needs are. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's just important to to think creatively, be scrappy, you know, find if, you know, uh, what do they say? It's um, that um, scarcity is the mother of invention. Yes. And, um, and so if you, if finances are scarce or say you're in a remote location, there's, there's a way to think creatively around it. Um, but you have to just really, think outside the box sometimes. And with that, we will go on to break, but I wanted to actually do a couple of announcements. Uh, wait, I just need to get my notes. Madeline, you're good. Oh, Never mind, we'll do that on the next break. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's getting into place and getting ready to start. So um, Tyler, before the, um, the break, you had mentioned your like teaching privately, like some artists offer that. Um, do you have experience with that? And how's that been? I do. I've been doing it on and off um, quite off lately because I'm just so busy. But um, I mean, it's been great. I had one student in Puerto Rico named Emmanuel. And when we started working together, he had done a couple paintings and that was during lockdown. And I, I'm just so proud of him because he just had his first solo show in Puerto Rico. And um, it's just, it's crazy watching people that might not have access like we do in New York City, just come so far. So that's really fulfilling. Where was the solo show? Was it in Puerto Rico or is yeah, it? That's awesome. In Puerto Rico. Chelsea, have you ever done private teachings or just in like a class setting? Um, yeah, I've, I've also, um, for a while now, I've been doing online critiquing and um, uh, just doing Zoom meetings with people independently. And then also I'm just going on one year now of working um, for Julia Aristides and her online atelier program as a mentor. Um, 
And that has been a really incredible experience. Um, and Juliet has just been absolutely wonderful person to work with. And her curriculum is just absolutely stellar. Um, I couldn't suggest that or speak highly enough of her program development. And um, the group of people that she has working there is really, they've really been fantastic and um, really passionate about the outreach and being able to get this kind of understanding it to people um, in a way that's maybe a little bit more accessible. There's a lot of people that are doing the program um, either kind of part-time in their own way or they're doing it in a more intensive manner. Um, it's just a really accessible way to learn how to, to paint and draw in the Western canon. And um, that's been a lot of fun. It's, I, yeah, I really enjoy the, the opportunity to teach online. Um, that's been great. So yeah, that's that's been a big part of how I've been able to sustain myself um, through um, getting my education and, and cost of living in, in New York. And I was waitressing for a while, um, which was also, you know, grateful for the opportunity to be able to work and do that. But man, that was hard. I think I did that. Um, both of us had to, we, you know, work like multiple jobs to be able to afford moving and saving up to do this and then work through the program. And there's, you know, quite a lot of us that have had to, to work while, while studying. I'm really glad, glad you brought that up. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people wouldn't, um, I don't know, there's some like negative connotations to like getting a part-time job or something while working as an artist. Like people, some people might think that it's, then you're not really an artist or something ridiculous like that. But I mean, you got to do what you got to do and mm -hmm. you're working towards a goal. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, my, I mean, I had to, uh, for a good year and a half, to save up for moving to New York, I was, like, flipping foreclosed houses with somebody, and that was just so much work. And, I mean, my attitude is if you're serious about this as a career, you'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, there's, no, there's no shame. Yeah, I mean, I know someone, too, even who, like... Back in the day in New York, he, uh, to help fund his practice, he learned how to do plumbing. And he actually met, became friends with, and, and worked alongside Robert Rauschenberg because he got a gig fixing the plumbing in his apartment. <laughs> and like, you just never know who you're going to meet and work with. And there's a lot of people out there that, you know, the hustle is real. Like, not everybody has this ride funded from the get-go. And you have to really be... Um, flexible and willing to do what it takes. Uh, um, it's not an easy ride. Um, and it's a lot of spending money to make money, a lot of delayed gratification. Um, One of our favorite sayings in the studio is like, whenever you have a challenge or something you have to overcome, you always say, it's okay, it's good for the plot. Cause it really helps like <laughs> develop your character and it, it's yeah. just, it's good for the plot. Yeah. So. That's so true. Tyler, I see that you're putting gouache on, on to your, your paper. Could you talk a little bit about your process there and what you're thinking? Yeah. So I've been talking since yesterday about how, in the language of drawing that I'm choosing to use, I'm separating light from shadow. Um, because to me, like, you know, light is one event. It's where everything in the lights is directly interacting with the photons from the light source. Everything that's definitively shadow is not interacting with those photons. So it's important to me that I keep those two events separate. Now, highlights are the area of specular reflection. Those are yet another third separate event. And I just like in a drawing to treat those three events separately. So 
I'm using gouache right now to just carve out the specular reflection or the highlights. And once I can establish that upper end of my range, that'll tell me what I have to do with the half tones and the lower end as well to bring this forward. Chelsea, are you going in with, is that a white charcoal or um, what are you working on right now? Oh, this is, I'm doing a bit of a back and forth, like with um, working in pencil and then um, using that, that little white eraser pencil mm -hmm. and just kind of heightening. Um, I didn't quite maybe sculpt up the the form as as high as I wanted to sort of push the value up um, as much as I could um, yesterday. And so I'm just sort of adding clay, so to speak. Is that usually how you kind of think about your form building kind of more sculpturally? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, a lot of the language that we, that we both use in our own mind as we're trying to build this um, is like reinforcing the thought process with the language that's more sculptural and in the 3D, like rather than saying like, this needed to be lighter in value, we would say it needed to come up toward the light um, or turn down away from the light um, as opposed to like lighter, darker. Um, I think reinforcing it with the language is incredibly helpful to get yourself to sort of engage with the work in a way that's more tactile. To follow up really quickly on your um, discussion of, of language and creating a visual language, um, I know here at East Oaks, uh, oftentimes when we're critiquing or, or discussing our subject, it's very difficult uh, to articulate the exact thing that we're referencing. And so we'll almost like end up creating our own vernacular in a way um, of describing the form and describing the shape um, as like, oh, this shape is a sad shape to indicate like it turning away in space or like something, you know, of that variety. Um, is there anything that you guys tend to do when, you know, giving critiques or, or advice or anything like that? Um, that's sort of like linguistically, like you kind of have to come up with your own vocabulary. I said you can really only speak through metaphor when you're talking about this kind of stuff. So I guess everything is helpful. Yeah, you know, some kind of shorthand language. We always say, and we didn't come up with this, but we always say that you have to be the ant you're just hiking around the form. You're not making value decisions, you're making form decisions. So you have to hike your way everywhere you go. Um, also too, I know I've, I've realized when we're talking about um, people like drawing and painting portraits and figure, um, something that we always say is, you know, is she looking deflated? you know, no concave, there's no concavities. There's there's maybe either more planar moments that are like harder, sharper, more angular, like exposed bone, or it's muscle or it's a fat pad. Um, so like soft and fleshy and full, everything is gonna have some kind of fullness. And often if the form is running flat, you're making a person who looks like the air has been let out of them. <laughs> or, you know, maybe they, they're dead and everything's a little more constricted and decaying. <laughs> um, so yeah, kind of exercising that kind of thinking um, really starts to come out. Um, or wooden, a lot of people end up making people that look wooden, like a medieval sculpture or something carved out of wood. They're too angular and edgy and the form is just like flat planes of value that never got really 
fully expressed. Um, and you get these like little wood people um, as opposed to something that feels like this fleshy, you know, vitality expressed. Um, We were talking a little bit yesterday about like finding an art community, like GCA has its own little community of artists. East Oaks is its own little community of artists. Um, Kristen is asking, how do you have any advice for finding and building a local art community? Um, they said they've met some very kind local artists, but don't want to overstep the bounds. So oh. any advice for that? Don't want to overstep. Um... Gosh, well, the overstepping thing really comes down to like basic social skills. <laughs> like, am I, you know, if I press and I ask and they're responsive, great, awesome, keep asking. Um, if someone, I think that you kind of have to like suss out for yourself, like what feels maybe too pushy. But a lot of times, you know, try and reach out. Usually people are, if you have a shared passion, no matter who you are, like people love being able to share that passion with someone. And if you're, especially if you're interested in who they are and how they made it and what's going on with them, like people love to share themselves with people. Um, it's so much a part of, you know, why we do this is, is that aspect of sharing, sharing the thing that we loved making. Um, that's a big part of the communication of art making. So I think there's more people out there that are willing to commune with you than you maybe think. Um, so putting yourself out there and then just like read the room in terms of, you know, maybe not wanting to overstep boundaries that that's specific to the personality and stuff. But I would say just, you just try and I think you'll be surprised. Um, also too, in the smaller communities, somehow getting the word out there that you're here and you're interested in doing this. I think will attract people. Like there's a surprising, even here in North Carolina, like seeing just how many people in this area have gone through classical training and are in, are interested in making work in this fashion. Like we had dinner last night with a great group of people and I never ever would have guessed that this many people in North Carolina have gotten the similar training that, that we have and are interested in making this kind of work. and sharing similar values, like just coming out of the woodwork, um, you know, simply because there's, you know, wonderful artists like Lewis that have made an effort to extend the invitation, um, an effort to start building the community. It's shocking sometimes how long that can take, but also how little it can take sometimes to actually, you know, find your people. You just have to get creative about how to get the word out there and, and, and meet them. Um. You know, um, to add to that, just because I've been in the trenches doing that part of uh, trying to create a community, if I were to give someone advice when they're very first starting is, is that it comes down to a relationship of trust first, that don't, don't try to dive into asking to come over and paint with them or, or draw with them, but just invite them to dinner and anyone who else is in the area that is in like-minded nature. And um, if you don't even feel comfortable with that, and ask them if they want to go to coffee, that you'll treat them to coffee. Something where you are being generous to them and in order just to be able to enjoy each other's time to talk about something you both love. Once you start developing a bit of a relationship, you can really feel out a person of how uh, inviting or how um, secluded they want to be. So some people, um, you know, are far more reclusive and far more introverted and don't necessarily uh, feel comfortable being around people while they paint or draw, but then you, you'll get to that vibe by spending time and actually developing just a relationship with them. 
And as time goes on and inviting them to be a part of your studio or inviting them for um, an interesting event that you all might have, you know, that you might be creating, such as like having a, a figure come in or a, a model come in that you might be doing a figure drawing or a um, portrait model for a portrait drawing and uh, want to be like, hey, I don't know if you're interested in this, but would love to split the cost and, you know, or the first time come on over and just experience life over at this studio and check it out. And then as you develop one, one turns into two, two turns into four. And it, it can if it grow as fast and as large as you want. Um, you know, there will be a point at which the community is the perfect size for you. So um, that would be my recommendation, but it always comes from your generosity first, not, um, not theirs. So don't ask until you've given. I feel like with community, you don't really realize how much you need it until you have it. Because most artists are kind of, you know, a little bit secluded. Um, that's kind of, it just comes with the lifestyle, I guess. Um, but like coming here to East Oaks, you never really realized how nice it is to just have a community of artists that all kind of do the same thing and enjoy talking about similar things. Um, it's something that I never knew I needed until I got here, but yeah, it's, it's been really nice. So, um, Kirsten, she says, thank you, by the way. Um, and she says she really loved that. So. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. I do believe you know, we were talking about earlier on life, life balance and how to sustain yourself as a creative. Um, absolutely part of that. I don't care how introverted you are by nature um, overall, I think we're a very extroverted um, being. And so we are on a spectrum of us needing less time with people and some with more. But a community of artists uh, that you can at least talk about your passions with is vital to creating a life balance and sustainability and not getting burned out in what you do. Um, find someone you know, we talk a lot about East Oaks. East Oaks wants to remain small and we, we enjoy being intimate. But um, one of the things we talk often about for your health as a, as a creative is to have someone who can pour into you, someone that is a peer that is running along the same race as you and someone that you can pour into. There's someone who always knows less than you that you can help. There's someone who always knows more than you and trying to seek out someone who, who can help you. And there's someone who is always very close to where you are in your stage of being a creative that is really great when the, when the times get hard and thin. Um, and so they're excellent supports. So if we're talking about life balance and keeping yourself healthy, mentally healthy, that is one of the best things you can do. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I couldn't agree more. All right, well, on that note, we're due for another model break. So we will be taking a five minute break for the model and then we will be back then. Okay. I think Louie has some announcements to make though before we cut. <laughs> also, sorry everyone. These are some announcements that I would like to make. Um, so. Due to the fact we wanted to make this out of gratitude for all of the support that Tyler and Chelsea have seen uh, due to their fire, we are making this available uh, for free for everyone to be able to enjoy. However, we will have several works of theirs that they've made in the past. We have images and a leak in the link in the show notes uh, to for purchase. And all of the proceeds will be going to Tyler and Chelsea. So um, 
And so we, East Oaks is trying our best to do what we can to continue to contribute to people and their success. And this is something that we uh, want to make available to everyone out there. So uh, go into our, our, um, our bot or the, the description below and you'll see a link for that. Also, there's uh, resources, materials list and resources. There's a link for that as well in the, uh, in the show notes. And a final thing is, is that we are giving away one year free membership to a uh, subscription to East Oak Studios platform. So um, we will make an announcement uh, afterwards, and there should be a link down there to apply for that as well. So thank you. All right, we are back from our model break. Um, and as a reminder, if you guys missed the announcement that Louie made, um, but we do have all the information in the video description if you're on YouTube. It has the reference images, the materials list for the both of them, and also the Atelier Live giveaway that they're gonna be doing for a year subscription. So just go to that link in the description if you wanna see all that. And as we're kind of nearing the end of this two day, we still have two sessions, but what are your thoughts on how you're gonna try and wrap up these drawings? So I'm gonna try to do a little bit of modeling and I, I advocate for not modeling a portrait in 30 minutes, <laughs> but here we are. Here we are. Um, Tyler, when you were doing the, the gouache highlights, we had a question from Penny. Um, she said, it's so easy to overdo the highlights. How do you restrain and create the careful hierarchy of light? Um, so with gouache, when you put it down and it's still wet, it looks way brighter until it dries and it gets a lot darker. So just through experience, I trust that it's going to darken down and I have to build them up to get to the value that I want. Otherwise, I mean, the other half of that question is I, I will try to think about the highlights as they flow from forehead to chin. And on this portrait, they seem to like start kind of soft and they pick up in the eyes quite a bit and then they soften again as they go down. So I, I think of like the path of the highlight as it travels from top to bottom. We have a comment from Christopher. He says, hi, Tyler and Chelsea, big fans of you both. Uh, my question is, in what ways besides your academic training has GCA helped inform you in the, in the professional work you plan to make in the future? My poor instructors, I've pestered them all for four years with business questions that they just don't care to answer. <laughs> like, how do you pay your taxes? <laughs> um, I mean, it's just been, so great to have working professionals coming in and out all the time that you can ask these questions to and you can see how they're handling their careers. Yeah, I would, I would say the same. Um, being able to talk with, with um, uh, something that is also happening in the environment we've been learning in that is similar to the tier, the sort of concept of the tier system of experience that Lewis was talking about, um, is that you have, you know, students below you in experience, people above you in experience, then you have um, emerging amateur artists that are often the residents, and then you have some instructors who are in their 40s and and some in their 50s that are, you know, 
either becoming more established as independent artists and careerists and, and some that are in their careers and are really well solidified in their reputation. And to be able to have that whole range um, to ask questions and to gauge your own goals on um, has been huge. Um, and it was part of the reason that we wanted to be in an environment like that um, was the access to working and sustaining artists that were willing to have conversations about what they've learned and what worked, what didn't work. Um, An instructor that I've met that's, I think had the most impact on me. Um, he's been teaching us, I mean, he taught me every year since my first year and just, just to watch how he carries himself as a professional has been such a huge impact. Um, like obviously you know you're going to school AGCA to be a professional, but you don't really understand what that word means until you see people doing it. Um, Ted was the first one to tell me that your job is to collect collectors. Ted was the first to tell me that when he finished his training, he held himself accountable to do either four small, two medium, or one large painting every month. And I don't have that same structure necessarily because I'm it's kind of hard when you're coordinating around a model's life schedule, but I mean, that, that idea doesn't occur to you until you hear it to uh, really be strict with your expectations of yourself. Ted is also the instructor that will talk me off a cliff every single time I get way too existential. So I don't know, it's been a blessing to meet an artist like that. I think it's really important to have like that mentor mentee relationship with professional artists. Um, I know you guys also, you studied at a university, like for your bachelor's, and then you went to an atelier. Um, and I feel like that's something that usually is lacking in the university system, whereas the atelier is kind of more leaning towards the traditional way of teaching. Because um, I know a lot of artists who have went that route with the Universities usually have a lot of complaints and just not the best experience with them. Um, so it's really nice to hear that GCA has really given you a lot of mentors. Yeah, it certainly, certainly has. I don't think, I don't think either of us would have come nearly as far as we have without the without these mentors really taking us under their wing um, in so many ways, um, from the, the personal to the business to holding us accountable and being really truthful, um, no matter how brutal, <laughs> about you know where we stand in our progress. Um, I wouldn't trade that for the world. We have a nice little compliment from Mustafa. He says, thanks East Oak Studios for being like Universal Studios. <laughs> two superstars in one movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Mustafa has always, ha always has the best lines.
We have a painting question, even though you guys aren't painting, I know that you still do paint in your normal practice. A um, few questions. Do you two paint with lead white? If not, what white paint do you use? And um, favorite mediums <coughs> and favorite oil paint brands? So take your pick at the questions. We both use lead white. Um, it's either Michael Harding Kremnitz white or Natural Pigments uh, lead white number two. Um, I just recently reintroduced titanium to my palette, which is helping me just push into those higher values because the translucency of lead white kind of limits what's possible in the lightest lights. Um, favorite paint brands, Michael Harding and Natural Pigments, probably, Rublev. Mm -hmm. And yeah. painting medium, I mean, we use a 50-50 mix of Gamsol and linseed oil. And I really like the Venetian medium by Rublev. It's leaded crystal glass and linseed oil. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much in the same uh, boat as Tyler in terms of materials. Uh, Rublev, natural pigments um, is the majority of what's in my toolbox. Um, Lead white. I don't use titanium as much as Tyler. I'm just I mean, starting yeah. to. Not that he uses it that much. I, I but barely use it. It's just when I need that <laughs> last kick and the lightest lights. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, strictly in the lightest lights. That's absolutely not how he's painting like his entire flesh string. Um, that's important to know. It is not a part of the top to bottom range. <laughs> yeah, titanium is notorious for drying darker, so I use it with a lot of discretion. Right, and it can also affect the way that, you know, the read of, of light refracting even in your painting itself. I mean, flesh is transparent and being able to have layers in the painting that also have an element of transparency is is really helpful and, and beautiful in trying to create this likeness of life and transcendent effect of light. Um, so having having that transparency of the lead is important and then layering the moments that are using titanium on top of that is important um, to understand. And do you also use the half linseed half um, paint thinner for your medium? Um, I, I don't, not so much lately. I did for a while and then now I'm kind of in a, a phase of being really, what I do most often is that the first layer of the painting is just oil paint and a little bit of paint thinner to get a soft velvety thin layer. Then paint on top of that with paint, like paint with paint, no medium added unless my, um, Unless what's coming out of the tube is too dry and I need to add a little bit of oil just to get it to be like a nice buttercream texture. But I don't consider that like adding medium. I'm not painting with a medium. I'm just like reviving the paint. Um, and then in a third layer, that more final sort of what some might call a glazing layer, that would be when I would add something like Venetian medium or like a couple drops of oil or something to um, a mixture. Um, that's what I do most often nowadays. I've been wanting to try that Venetian medium. So I guess it's just a perfect opportunity to just buy more art supplies. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah.
Another question we've been getting is, um, how often do you sharpen your pencils? Which seems very basic, but is also a good question. Um, do you like them to be like relatively sharp the entire time? Or do you sometimes prefer having them more dull? Or what are your thoughts on that? Usually I like them pretty sharp. Some drawings just call for a duller pencil. Um, not really this one. We've been sharpening every five minute break. And um, I mean, I'm about to resharpen mine right now pretty often. And Chelsea, for those who may have uh, missed yesterday, how did you tone your, your paper? Is that graphite powder or charcoal powder? Charcoal powder. Okay. Um, I prefer charcoal powder for toning the paper um, for a reductive drawing like this. Um, and I just use the, take the powder and take, um, in this case, I used a Kleenex because I forgot to bring my chamois um, and then just put a little bit on and then sort of wipe across and across um, and make a really, really nice thin layer. Um, the darker you apply it, the harder it is to be able to get it back to what's truly the white of the paper or the tone of the paper. Um, so being really careful about not putting too much. Flexibility is key throughout the whole process. We have a question from Bianca. Um, are you guys using a mirror or have you ever used a mirror in your in your usual drawing practice? I've been stepping back and using my phone as a mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it helps you see drawing mistakes pretty, pretty quickly. And by using your phone, you mean when you hold it up and then like close one eye? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, using the black mirror, the cell phone can be really, really helpful, especially when you don't have someone to critique you and you need to have a fresh eye. Something like that can make a huge difference. Um, and basically what you do is you just hold your phone. I don't have my phone on me, but if you had your phone and you hold it up to your your eye off like the black mirror and then look at your drawing in the reflection of the black mirror, it's as if you're seeing it with a whole new pair of eyes. Um, you've sort of gotten yourself out of the your attachment to anything that you thought was maybe so true. Um, and it allows you to sort of see the likeness with a freshness. And some people utilize it for value matching, seeing how true their values seem to read in relationship to the values up there. But that's not how we use it. It's a way of using it, but it's not the way that we use the mirror. Ours is for um, more often than not uh, drawing purposes. And then sometimes for gauging some value relationships, seeing if maybe we were contrasting things too much or if we were 
creating more um, of a value change in an area that actually was a very gradual, slow moving um, versus something that had like a very severe dropping and a, a severe turning. Sometimes it allows you to see that um, you kind of missed the mark on understanding what was happening. That's really interesting. I've seen that done before. The first person who I saw do that was Erica, one of the resident artists here, Erica Goody. And um, she uses it more as a compositional guide to see the value and the design too. So it's yeah. really awesome to hear how many uses there are for that. Totally. Yeah, we'll, we'll sometimes use it when we're um, trying to decide on, you know, big value shapes um, of a composition instead of necessarily like gauging exact value matching, but saying like, just saying like, okay, what's that big mass against that big mass? Um, how big or how small, how light or how dark is that big like overarching relationship? Um, All right, well, we are. All right, we are back from our model break. And just so everyone knows, this is the last session that we will be doing. So Tyler and Chelsea will be finishing up their drawings. Um, and also there will be a sale of their work after the workshop. So we'll be posting more information of that online. So just keep an eye out. Um, let's see how we have, how we are with questions. We have another question from Mustafa. He asked, do you have any cautions of layering graphite, specifically hard over soft or vice versa? Um, I think the two things that come to mind that I watch out for are, um, I, I said earlier that I like the softer pencils it's really easy to burnish the paper or score the paper with say a 4-H. And as I'm hatching, I just do everything I can to avoid perpendicular hatching and making like a window screen pattern. Um, that's really the only two things I concern myself with. Yeah. Hey everyone, at the end, after we are done with uh, the live stream, I want to let you know I'm going to put a camera on each drawing and do like a slow pan of the camera being right in front of the drawing because you've been seeing it slightly in perspective this whole time. Um, that way you get uh, a good feeling for exactly what they've drawn uh, for the past two days. Also, one more part of the announcement is that we will be releasing and announcing on a large email tomorrow with the available works that for for purchase for an additional fundraising proceeds for the artists um, tomorrow. So there'll be pricing sizes of all the pieces. We have a question that's for Tyler. Um, has Tyler ever done any silver point? His technique would lend itself very well to the medium. You know, I really, really want to try metal point. I just haven't yet. It's on my radar. Thank you for saying that. Um, with this being our last session, I wanted to ask you guys, um, having the limitations of working with a model and working within a session format, um, I know it's very tempting to like continue working with a drawing, but uh, regardless of this kind of format, when you're working, do you ever have difficulties like 
deciding, okay, this piece is done now? And um, what are some of the questions that you ask yourself in determining the finished nature of a piece? I struggle with that more with painting. It's so easy to overwork a painting. Um, I mean, drawings, you kind of kind of know when they're done. At this stage, what I want to do in the next 10 minutes is like, I'm just thinking of the drawing as a drawing and I wanted to like articulate the forehead better here with a darker line, but I feel like I need something over here to balance that out. So maybe I'll just like emphasize this terminator a bit or it's pretty dark down here. So, I mean, I'm just thinking about what the drawing needs at this point. The other day, Evie called a uh, time of death on her painting, which I thought was really funny because it was just like, all right, it's gone. I'm calling it. <laughs> and I think that's just like a nice way to kind of remove yourself from constantly trying to fix it. Just call time of yeah. death. I need to be a tradition now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the way that we paint and I mean, the way that we should be drawing is that we window shade. So if I'm modeling the forehead, I'm not going to move on from this forehead until it's as described as a volume as I can. And the idea is if you bring that full attention to every form, that attention is what's going to unify the drawing or painting. And um, what I'm really focused on right now is not going back as I'm painting through the form. So you're holding yourself accountable to be as present as possible with every brushstroke. And there's something to be said about that, um, the freshness of that first attempt. So in my experience, paintings get overworked the more you go back and forth. And I'm trying to be as conscious as I can about that lately. I think another way to figure out that um, tipping point of when to walk away is also like an experience points thing. And that the more you make, the more you start to realize like, okay, I do have a lot of opportunities to figure this out. It's not like I have one perfect painting that I'm just gonna keep reworking forever. And like everything I have is amounted in this one painting, realizing that every with every new one, there's fresh opportunity to sort of fail forward and understand um, what the process is supposed to feel like, uh, what it does feel like. Um, also, I feel like the more I was like taking photos of my work as it was developing, I remember there were a few distinct pieces where I reworked it so many times that when I looked back at pictures of it, I was like, this was like seven different paintings. If only those were each still alive. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> there was so much that would have been interesting if I could have had each of those. Um, and so I just started to try to really pay attention to when I feel like I'm, I'm reworking something out of an anxiety that maybe I should have just moved on um, and let that be. Um, and that also is a part of what Tyler was saying. And moving forward like a sincere decision you're making in each phase. Letting that play out and then be able to call it and say, okay, let's put energy into the next one. Let this just be what it was. Sometimes that's okay too. We have a question from Angus. Um, they are wondering, he says, I would appreciate your thoughts on additives that can be used um, for drawing. For example, Amaya Grapiti, which I hope I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, mm -hmm. um, has glycerin and honey to make more intense darks 
in her drawings. She puts honey in her drawings? Apparently. <laughs> All right, Amaya. All right, good. Uh, That's often used in watercolors. Oh, oh that's news it's to me. It's used in watercolors. It's additives. Um, a lot of the times, uh, people will put honey in with um, the gum arabic that's used in watercolor production um, and it can slightly change the tone but it has an elastic quality um, that changes the flow of the paint um, but I think the the point there that's really good to make is that um, you know oftentimes there's a lot of unconventional materials that actually can really benefit your art practice and material exploration um, is a valuable pursuit so uh, yeah, do you guys ever like deliberately really play around with materials much or just kind of find your comfort zone and, and stick in there? Experimental person, but forever is a long time. So who's to say? Yeah. You know what actually I would say to that is I'm not so at this point in time adventurous about playing into materials. I really enjoy that and I really enjoy it when other people do it. Um, in this season of life, though, a certain mentality that I'm trying to push myself in is in application and in the phases of a painting and in the phases and stages of modeling in a portrait, like, how am I using this tool? Like, what is the entire range and variety I can get with this one tool? It can produce both line and mass, and that can be expressed and represented in many different types of hatching and application, a sort of handwriting Something that Tyler and I talk about quite a lot is that there can be this, what we said yesterday, a lyrical sort of calligraphic um, use of the tool. And there can also be something that's maybe more of a hieroglyphic, more like um, gritty application of the tool. Um, and trying to understand how I can use those to create something that's still a naturalistic representation, but also to create more of that like ethos and experience of this person. Um, and especially with paint, what sort of uh, scrubbing or transparency, um, opacity, um, hatching and drawing with the paintbrush versus um, like a big feeling like a pushing of, of clay and turning the brush to create the sort of effect of that exact turn of the form, feeling like my hand is actually on that thing and then expressing that same action with the brush there's like a huge amount of manipulation of the medium of just one medium um, without necessarily exploring how I can introduce new mediums to create certain effects and appearances and use of the tool, um, which is amazing and an awesome venture, which I would absolutely um, suggest to anyone who's curious. But even with just like keeping it real simple, um, there's a lot of experimentation um, without even like falling into affect, but just like, what's the whole range of what this medium has to offer me to express naturalism? Um, that's something that I've been engaging with more and more, but keeping it in check too, and, and not just thinking like, am I doing this just to like, feel like I made something look cool? Like, cause that's not what the aim is for me either, but um yeah, how can I, how can I push my tool to serve its best purpose? Something I do think about quite a lot. We have kind of a fun question here, um, but which painter from the past would you wish to know all of the technical aspects of painting that they knew? Oh gosh. Technical aspects? I mean, probably Rembrandt. Yeah, Remy. <laughs> that guy's got range. He's like, I think from, from a technical standpoint, 100% Rembrandt, I think is like master of paint um, and its full range and master of light in its full capacity um for sure um oh, 
Man. But if I could go to anyone's studio back in time, it would probably be Rodan. I have a huge art crush on Rodan. And that would be my guy for sure. If I could go back in time. And you guys are getting a lot of thank yous for all answering their questions. Everyone is very grateful for your answers. Awesome. Thank you guys. Seriously, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, and this conversation, the dialogue has been really, really awesome. Oh, wait. Hold on. Um, but the list for all materials is going to be on the the um, East Oaks website. So when you go on the Atelier Live, just go to resources, and all of the materials that they're using is going to be listed on there. Also, everyone, I'm going to be putting out the announcements again, which is yet again, like Tina just said. In the description below, you'll be able to get their materials list. Also, um, they will have multiple works available. Uh, starting tomorrow, we will put out an email blast. Make sure you sign up for East Oaks uh, email and newsletter, and we'll be happy to put you on that list uh, of announcing some of the paintings that will be for sale as as a bit of a an extra fundraiser, 100% of, of the um proceeds of it will be going to Tyler and Chelsea. Also, uh, we, if you need uh, reference images in order to look at their vantage points, you know, to paint along or draw along, they also are a link in our bio or description. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining. We still have a few minutes left, but I just wanted to put out the announcement one more time that we also are putting, doing a, uh, a one year free subscription. There should be a link in the description for applying for the opportunity for a one year subscription to East Oak Studio. And as we're nearing the end, we have a few people that are um, saying their thanks. So Kirsten, um, she says, I've learned so much the last two days. Thank you for this workshop. Awesome. And then Thank also you. from Scott, he says, I've really enjoyed watching and learning. Thank you. It's been so cool to see the drawings develop over the past two days. I'm really glad we did a two-day workshop. It allowed you guys a lot more time with the model and a lot more time to flesh out these drawings. And they look sick, so <laughs> doing great. So we're in the last three minutes um, and we have some more people. So um, Faye says cheers from England mm -hmm. and then Leaf, which I believe was from Sweden, if I remember correctly. Um, they say they've been drawing along doing figure practice. You guys have been great company. Thanks oh, so much. That's awesome.
Um, will you guys be working on the drawing after you finish with the model at all, or is this going to be the very end of it? It'll probably be the end. I would like to, but yeah, as much as we have much like time. To yeah, for this, we'll be getting ready to hop right back on a plane and head back to New York and <laughs> back to school in the studio tomorrow. So we won't have too much time to sort of fuss with the finessing moments of the drawing, but um, if only we could, this has been so much fun um, and we have an amazing model. So I wish we could just keep working on the drawings and stay here a bit longer. Well, Jackson says the conversation has been awesome and insightful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Sheila says, thank you. These drawings are brilliant and it was very kind of you all to share your process with us. Awesome. All right, well, that's, that's it for time. <laughs> so, Louie, have anything to say? Thank you, everyone, who uh, who joined this this time, and thank you for all the people who contributed to Tyler and Chelsea get, getting back on their feet after such a tragedy. Um, thank you to Tyler and Chelsea for uh, coming down here and spending their weekend to to do this. Um, and I know that the audience deeply appreciates your expression of gratitude. And thank you to Madeline for modeling for us and all the people behind the camera, Tina <laughs> and Evie. Y'all have been all so wonderful. So everyone, like I said before, one more final announcement that there will be a few more works available tomorrow. There'll be an email blast. Get on our email list as well as um, we're sending out a free subscription for a year to East Oaks Studios platform. So make sure you click the link in the description. Thank you so much for everyone's time and y'all have a happy, happy Sunday. <laughs>